Poker students are obsessed with their short-term graphs, with big upswings, downswings, times they paid someone off and maybe could have folded, times they bluffed it off and maybe could have refrained. The list goes on. But what's secretly killing the win rate of so many of my students before I diagnose it is how they play the common spots. Poker situations can be important to work on either because of their frequency of occurrence or their magnitude. What you're going to see today is the former. It really is a case of death by a thousand small pots. This has been what's responsible for Jess's declining red line. It's really stopped her propelling her game off the ground and getting that really good win rate that she wants thus far. But today was an epiphany. I walked away from the session with that absolute teacher's glow, that satisfaction that I'd done something really important for my student. And I know that Jess walked away from this session with a ton of stuff to work on, really eager and enthusiastic to get started. She'd been playing small pots quite suboptimally. We're going to show you exactly what was wrong with her thought process in these situations today and give her a roadmap to fix them. If you like this series from Stalling to Mulling, do drop us a little comment, a like, let us know it really helps us continue to provide you with this content. Now let's get to the episode. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the return of your favourite YouTube series in all of existence of all time. This is, of course, from Stalling to Mulling. Jess, you are on a little bit of a downswing, but I want to start off on a positive note here, despite how March, the start of March here, despite how that's gotten, the start of March is basically right at this dip. That's when the month began and it seemed to be cursed for you. But I'd love to start on a positive note and say, well, look what's happened since coaching. You're actually technically in profit here over the 13,000 hands since the series started. When we began, you were like 4 BB per 100 losing before rake back. You're now breaking even over this sample. What do you think? Do you feel like your game is, you do just have a higher objective true win rate? Obviously, we can't see that, but do you think you do have a higher true win rate now than you did a few weeks back? I definitely think so. I still think there's definitely still plenty of leaks to fix, but like I'm feeling at the minute when I'm playing sessions that I'm a winner at 25 an hour on GG. It's just some kind of rough hands that happen. That's fantastic. Yeah, definitely. I'm feeling much, much better. Good. If you're already winning, that would be incredible. I would be a little bit careful about jumping to that conclusion, but you do know best because you're in game and you know what it feels like to be you while you're playing. And I do think that there is a huge shift in confidence for people when their true win rate goes up. It does follow a different mental state and just like a kind of clarity. So yeah, I'm really happy with how we've started. I do think your progress has been great. Today, we're going to do something a little bit unexpected. And instead of just looking at only big pots, we are going to look at this king king hand that you really want to talk about where we've lost the stack and we want to get a bit of a sanity check on that. But we're also going to dive into small pots, medium sized pots, the real nitty gritty. I want to see what you're like in the wild, like in your own habitat when you're not being watched. I want to like film this like a David Attenborough in the bushes kind of thing and like stalk you when you don't know and look at the little pots that you probably wouldn't normally mark and bring to coaching. So why don't we do that today and see what kind of leaks we can unearth. We've already talked about polarization mistakes and things like that, but I'd love to talk today about all the other kinds of weird and wonderful mistakes that might be residing in your game. Yeah, sure. So not all of these hands are going to be exciting, but they will be highly educational. If they're really dull, don't worry guys, we're going to edit them out. We're not going to talk about some icy bit flop, they fold. Let's move on. So queen six five, obviously flop strategy is something that I'd love to hear your thoughts on just like how you approach the spot and I want you to keep this really brief today I'm going to try and do my part to not ramble on like a maniac and that'll be tough for me but maybe you can also help by keeping your answers as concise as possible maybe even use a thought process that you think you could use with you know 10-15 seconds on the clock as if you were in game so how does your flop thought process go here? Here would be kind of have a caught anything of it and what does that kind of look like for my hand I think probably out of position like this this is kind of a bit more focused on my hand than kind of the range. Okay, so I'd like to make a few adaptations to this thought process. So the first one I want to make is I'd like you to start off with a vague world favorability assessment. And I don't know if you've covered a lot of that in the Carrot Poker School yet. I know you've been working through grade one of our theoretical academic course on CarrotCorner.com. I don't know where you've got to, but world favorability is this idea of your range being entitled to a certain amount of the pot share in EV and your opponent's range being entitled to the other amount of that. And that's obviously a, a zero sum game at 100%. So if you have 60% pot share, they have 40, for example. So here 
your favorability is going to be the first thing I would think about. And Queen 6 5, I don't think it's an amazing board, blind versus blind, but I think it's fine. And I think your range is probably entitled to a bit more of the pot than villains, right? So that would mean that you have this thing called a global frequency or base C bet frequency for your range overall, right? And we're not looking at your hand yet, but we will very soon. Your global bet frequency okay. here, it would be around for a small sizing if you're using one third pot, which I'd imagine you would be your global bet frequency with your range would probably be around 50% of the time, 40, something like that. Now, some hands will bet more than that and some hands will bet less than that. And we're not sticklers for frequencies here at Carrot Corner. We're not trying to get you to use an exact frequency because there is no magical, you know, monsoon of money from the sky if you get the frequency right. You don't get rewarded by the poker gods for getting a frequency right, but it does give you a better idea of like how you're playing. Here, some hands bet, let's say your global bet frequency is 50 for your range. Some hands bet more often than that and some bet less often than that. Some you are optional in betting, some maybe you're not allowed to bet. That's really how it goes. Jack 10, yeah. would you guess that this would bet more or less often than the average bet frequency for your range? Let's start with that. I think less often. I actually think this one might bet more often. Right. That's okay. because it's actually, when you're building a betting range on the flop, it tends to be of a polar nature. The hands that bet less often than the global frequency are twofold. They're either something horribly awful, like the King Deuce of Hearts that only has one overcard to the six, for example, or they're something very mediocre that checks for that mediocrity to avoid a polarization mistake. So a hand that would bet less often, or perhaps never here, would be something like the Ace Nine of Hearts, the Ace Deuce of Hearts, maybe that probably bets sometimes with backdoors, something like King Deuce, something horrible like that, although that can still probably bet here in this world. But I think something like Jack Ten is going to be quite a nice bluff. It has really nice pair draws that I don't think you're thinking about. I don't think that you're really, you say that you've missed completely or you haven't caught any of it. I would modify that and say, actually, if you hit a jack or a 10 here, that, that's quite good. Blind versus blind, where ranges are wide, you do have two overs to the six, the five, all pocket pairs that villain can reasonably have. You have backdoor straight outs as well, and you have low showdown value. So when you put all of that together, low showdown value, backdoor draws, over cards, live pair draws that are quite good, this hand is in your bluff range at some frequency, and you should definitely be mixing some bet here. You are building your flop C bets way too linear, and you're actually committing a kind of exploitative atrocity here. And that atrocity, that's a bit of a strong word, but what you're doing is you're actually using too strong and linear and value heavy a betting range against a pool that under raises and overfolds the spot. So it's actually the opposite exploitative path to the one that we would like to take. Because if you look at a solver here, and I'm not suggesting that, you would see that when you bet one third here, people are meant to raise more often than might be intuitive, and they're meant to make some very loose, like floaty calls with like king ten off and stuff like this that a lot of people don't make. So I would say err on the side of betting your trashier, bluffier hands with that have live pair draws, err on the side of betting them against unknown people in this pool because it will be better exploitatively than playing a more linear value heavy strategy. So right away, I know why your red line is going down too much. You're imposing standards upon yourself for bluffing early streets that are not justified and they're actually arbitrary. But more than that, they're costing you money exploitatively, if that makes sense, because of the way people are reacting to bets. Right. That's quite a lot to take in, but does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think check is worse here than in game theory, because what do you have to do if you check here and face like a half pot says bet? What would you do? Fold. You'd fold. Yeah, me too. So if I checked here and faced half pot, I'd fold. Therefore, we can say that's a bad branch of the tree. If I have to fold and my pot share goes to zero when I fold, that is a bad branch of the tree. Okay. What if I told you that branch happens more often in practice than it does in theory, where they bet the flop? If it happens more often in practice than in theory. Yeah, would you believe me if I told you that was the case, that humans actually bet here when checked to more than a solver does? Probably, because yeah. it's like the weakness thing, isn't it? Right. Exploiting weakness, exactly. And they're right to do that. They're not wrong to do that, because most people in your shoes play the same way. Your leak here is very typical of the pool. When you have a leak that's typical of the pool, you become an antelope in a pack or herd of hunted antelope and you're all acting the same way and pool is exploiting that herd and if you're one of the herd you get exploited by proxy, you're in the herd. You have to be careful here. What you need to do is be the wolf in the antelope's clothing. I think that's how the expression goes. <laughs> so if you're the wolf in the antelope's clothing then you just bite back at the lion and you're actually someone with an overprotected checking range here. So what I need you to do in this spot for me in future is check raise the hell out of people with good hands and decent bluffs and just bet your weaker bluffs immediately. This is how you exploit this pool. You want to get the hell out of 25 and L. You want to get to 50 and L. You want to accelerate that win rate. 
don't play in a way that justifies pulls and balances. Play in the opposite way that exploits those imbalances. Okay. That's a big change you're going to have to make here. Yeah, definitely. I don't think there's many kind of check raises in this spot at all in my game. I check raise mostly, I would say, from the big blind against like a button or a cutoff open that I've just called and just check raising when the board kind of comes low and hits my range for calling there. That's literally the only check raises I do, I think. Say you have a team that's way too aggressive. They just press, press, press in football. They just go forward all the time. They overextend. They don't leave enough people back and you can hit them on the break really successfully. How do you set up against that team? You defend kind of deep with and then just punt the ball forward once you get possession. You become Italy, effectively. You just sit there and then you just hit them and then you just try and like not concede and then score a few goals and win the game and then you just shut up, shut up. This analogy, how does it work here? Well, if you're not actually inviting them forward, they can't do the thing that's bad. Like if you're not letting them come at you and you're not sitting back, you're not creating the opening. You're not creating the weakness that you can exploit. So here, if you're betting all of your good hands, you're never actually inviting them into the node where they make the mistake and you're actually playing a counter productive strategy against pool. This is why people don't win at poker. This is why people fail to prioritize their... Trevi. I hope this is an epiphany. I hope this is really eye-opening and it'll kind of, you'll look back on this session and be like, wow, that's when I first realized I was actually playing completely backwards against pool in a simple common spot like this. Now, a spot can be meaningful to your win rate either because it's very impactful in terms of magnitude or it's impactful in terms of frequency of occurrence. This spot's not impactful in terms of magnitude because the pot's really small, but guess what? It happens all the time. So it's actually super important in terms of win rate. Okay. So we check, they check, and we have this turn. Quick thought process. Let's see, you've got 10, 15 seconds on the clock. You're in game, go. I'd maybe take a stab at this because we've just, they've checked back flop and we've just got a few more outs. We've built up like, we've got the kings and they've checked flop. Okay. See, when you're thinking about bluffing on the flop of the turn or even the river for that matter, I want you to start at world favorability. Is your range in a favorable world here or an unfavorable world? Meaning, do you have more than 50% pot share EV or less than 50% pot share EV with your range? Forget your hand for now. With my range, more. Absolutely. So you are the range advantage player here. You're the overdog. They are the underdog. We're going to be getting the best of it here, which means that not only should we bluff Jack-10 and we can do this really frequently and we can just do it till our heart's content, we can also bluff all kinds of other hands. That means that when you're in the spot with 10-9, you should be bluffing at a decent frequency, in theory. And in practice, you should always bluff 10-9. In practice, you should never check 10-9 here. Because if you do, you're passing up on a spot where the fold equity is much higher than it is in theory. And that means it's exploitatively mandatory to bet 10-9 here. Okay. I'm hitting you with a whole new level of stuff today. I hope you can yes. now see how it's actually very important not to dwell on short-term graphs and big pots. Because see that red line of yours that just goes steadily down in a smooth fashion? This is why. If you don't bet 10-9 here, this is why. If you don't bet this hand on the flop, this is why. Imagine we fix that red line and we get it stabilized a bit, but your blue line still remains quite good. It's going to make you a winning player quickly. Most of the stuff people are doing wrong is right under their nose the whole time. And they don't see it because they can't see the forest of the trees. They're looking at all these big pots and coolers and graphs and they're getting bogged down in the winds of variance. So this turn check, not a van. No. Love this spot. It's one of my favorite spots. Go. 10 seconds. Let's do it. Now I think we have some value to call. We've just caught something and they've been quite weak or quite passive, sorry. And they could probably stab this quite wide, I think. All right. Put it into my lingo for me. Put it into my nerdy speak. This spot is? Overbluff. Star. Fold. <laughs> You're folding a bluff catcher <laughs> in an overbluff node. Why? Because it's a small pot and you don't care enough about small pots and you care too much about big pots and you don't care enough about the nitty gritty smooth parts of the graph and you care too much about the big spikes of the graph this is what's going on in your game yeah i agree that i'm definitely on this if we fix this it's going to be immensely powerful fingers crossed we're going to fix it this is not difficult to fix now that you're aware of it it's a case of not knowing it's not a case of not being able to these aren't complex things they're just things that were going under your radar okay so we have a limper it looks like do we yes we have a uh, no, that's a min open min open sorry we go for the Three bet. Check. Check. Okay. So this is, I mean, probably here, honestly, I would just jam the flop. I mean, okay, you don't get many better hands to fold. I guess check's okay. You might make, I don't think you'll make a sex fold. Yeah, probably you should just check here and 
at least try and get a villain to like bluff the turn with Jack 10 of spades, then get it in, in good shape sometimes. So I love the flop check back here. But I want to talk about this spot where we face this bit and we do fold here, but I'd like to hear your thought process. What would it have been in game? How does it go? My thought process here would have been that the rest of their stack is probably going in on the river regardless. We've got king high, which can sometimes be good. We've also got the queen high flush draw, but it might just be kind of calling sometimes for the sake of calling like... I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like it's a bit too stationy sometimes. Okay, let's get away from too stationy, too tight, too passive, too nitty, all of this, because it's actually a bit arbitrary for my liking. I think we need to engage a bit more with the specifics of this spot. Yeah. What is the, I know this is on screen for you, but when you face third pot, if you remember the whole thing we talked about with pot odds and yes. the, the sort of experiment, how do we do that? In this, you add up the pot that's there at the minute with their bet plus, and then work out what your call is as a proportion to that pot. So in this spot, it's like four or 50, something like that. And we're calling $1.10, one in four. So you've got to put your money in there as well. It's actually the pot after you've invested that you compare that money you put into. So once you put in $1.10, the pot becomes five fifty. So it's, yeah, it's, it's basically, one yeah, one in one in five, exactly. Yeah, just just keep practicing that and you will be able to do it in game really quickly. I think there are little cheat programs that help. I'm not sure they're approved by T's and C's though. So I would learn how to do it yourself. So yeah, 20%. Now, I feel like we can just have the best hand like some amount of the time that's close to that here. Yes, we may have to invest the rest on some blank rivers and that might be kind of horrible. I think you have to close your eyes and actually call here because... If we count up your outs, the clubs are going to be good a lot of the time. Okay, so let's say that we have like maybe seven instead of nine. Let's say the king and the queen are good sometimes. So we have four instead of six. I'm just de decreasing the outs here a bit for the chances that they're going to be bad, that you're going to be dominated. But I still think we're getting close to 20% equity. And I think there's some implied odds on a club. And I think there is also the chance that this player just has like 10, nine or something random at some frequency as well. So I don't think you can fold here, actually. I think you have to call. Okay counting the outs on the turn that's the outs times two is like a rough equity in it yep. and then on the flop it's times four right exactly but i didn't count all of the outs because i felt like there was some proportion of the time that were dead to boats and flushes and stuff like that already so i was just being a bit cagey with it but this player's range will be very wide so i don't think we need to be too cagey i think you have to call the turn and i know it sucks but i think it's it's better I wouldn't put it all in the flop just because the SPR is low, guys. If you're wondering that, that's not a reason to put it all in the flop. You do have to compare the EV of one line against another. Okay, so 3x here. We go for a 3-bet with pocket jacks. Let's keep looking at these sort of mundane common spots. They're so important to win rate. Check, and we check back on the flop, which I think is fine. I think like this is the sort of board where you can probably bet anything and everything, and it doesn't really matter. Almost any hand here is going to be okay to bet a third with, but if I was ever going to check a hand, it would be something like jacks. Check, 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 check. Yeah, you just you just want to show down here. This is a very ambitious value bet. Mm. This is a value bet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's okay, but I feel like the issue I have with this is just that a queen will very often play this way. It will play this way, like a decent frequency, and it will call you for sure, and you will lose. Yeah, yeah okay, maybe you can go for a better value for a small size against like nines, tens, eights, etc. I think in GTO terms, you never do this because villain can still be trapping and have a bit of a stronger range. But in practical terms, maybe you can get away with this actually. Probably okay. Okay, so we open queen seven in the cutoff, get called by big blind, yep. see bet flop. And we go for turn see bet. So thought process in this spot, off we go. See bet and paired boards, like standard in position, I reckon, for me. And then when the other jack comes on the turn, I mean, we see bet paired boards because it's harder to hit them. So when there's like more cards that makes it harder for them to hit, I think this isn't a bad barreling card. Sorry, this isn't a bad card to bet. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it might be better just to say, do we think pool is overfolding here? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Do we think they're folding more than they should be? You might be right. I don't Possibly. know. Possibly. I don't know, actually. Saying that, I think maybe people check call with like ace X here because they see the two pair with the ace kicker and think they might be good. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be careful about good barreling card again because if this spot's not overfolded, then in what sense is this a good barreling card? You need to go to the fold equity. That's what matters. I agree that they have less Jack X now, but also this is very bad for your range, this card, because Jack X now beats all of your overpairs. So from a range perspective, this isn't a card we should be going too crazy on, but we should be bluffing at a decent clip. I don't think this is a theoretical bluff because you block some back doors and 
you don't have two over cards to that many of their pocket pairs. I think the hands you would be bluffing on this node would be things like queen 10, 10, 9, king 10, stuff like that, that has more live outs against pocket pairs than queen 7 does. Also, you wouldn't want to bluff with the spades in theory, but that's just theory. Then you can go ahead and say that you want the barrel here as a bluff, you want the bluff here if you think the spot is overfolded. Like if you think that when they get here with ace x, for example, or a pocket pair, they're folding too often, and you might be right about that. I don't know, it's very player dependent. I do suspect that triple barreling here is really good. I do suspect that like this is a spot where the third barrel performs pretty well, and I don't mind your plan here if you do embark on the third barrel as well. Because I think a lot of ace x and pocket pairs will call turn a lot here. I don't know that it'll be overfolded on turn. I do suspect that because they do have less jack x here and they don't really have a lot of deuce x here, they're probably going to be overfolding by river in this spot by and large. And therefore it's okay to embark on this play. When you hit the seven, very clear check back. You now have the middle of your range so you would never bet. So I think you played this hand quite well. But again, I don't love the whole they have less jack x so it's a good barrel card. I think it would be better to say, do I think they're overfolding this texture? on either the turn or the river and if so that's a reason to barrel and if not then you need to be a bit more careful and it might not be plus EV or might not be the highest EV play. When we're bluffing we go straight to this question are they overfolding? This is really the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting spot so we open queens and hijack we pick up a raise from butt and a fold from big blind comes back to us thought process here let's go 10-15 seconds. Probably just call on out of position I don't like being raised kind of multi-way this is a board that kind of hits his little range for calling in position from a hand reading standpoint what would you add to that if i said can you tell me another 10 seconds of thoughts about the opponent's rough range composition here what kinds of hands are in it what does it look like rough range is for raising i think i like fives fours threes sixes slow played like maybe kings like kings and aces that have slow played possibly but that's not very likely because mm -hmm. it was just a single raise part and then maybe something like 5x, I don't know, like 5-6, five, 4-5, six, 6-7. Six, yep. So I think kind of mergy strong sets in it, overpairs in it. I'd also say that they'll have some 9s and 10s and jacks as well. I think that's the main region that I didn't hear you mention there that I would definitely add to that. Right. And I think that the sizing is indicative of a weaker player. This is a tiny, tiny sizing because actually it's not a terrible sizing, but it is small. As if he was to call, if this player was to call your 70, the pot is going to become 315 and then they'd only be making it like another 120 it's quite a small percentage of that new pot so a raise is kind of like a call plus another bet and if you think about the call going in first and then the other 120 going in the 120 is a tiny part of that new pot that's the way to sort of see how small this sizing is i think they are probably a weaker player based on that and therefore we can give them a bit of a more mergy range we can give them some eights some nines some tens five six five all the hands you mentioned sets yeah i agree so i think you have a call against that i don't think you have enough ev here to three bet for value and i definitely don't think you should fold so that looks good we check and they go for a large bet so when this happens i sort of say to my students wake up sit back rub your eyes and sort of put on a new set of lenses on which to view this spot because this is a change in range makeup, right? So let's go for a 15 second thought process here where we address that change. What does it mean? What's villain's range now? What should we do? I think it's filtered with the bigger bet on the turn. Obviously the ace is pretty bad for us as well anyway, but I think the big bet with the raise on the flop and then a big bet on the turn like this, that's filtered into quite strong and it's kind of sets, a lot of sets and stuff that hits like the ace, like maybe the... Raise dice king or raise queen, I don't know. So we have a polarized range. What's the word I want to hear here about this polarized range? It is doing what? It is what? It is... Oh my god. I'm I'll give you a clue. A you've, you've already answered this question earlier today and it's the same answer as earlier. This range <laughs> is. This spot is. Under bluffed. Under bluffed. That's the one because what you're saying is that Villain no longer has the merged range they had on the flop. The fives, the tens, the jacks, the nines, these are dissipating now. They're kind of gone, but they still have the sets and some bluffs, but the bluffs are very, you know, represent a very small part of this range in their numbers. You know, there's not many bluffs kicking about here at all in the true range of our opponent. And therefore, in terms of true EV, we are clearly folding here. There's absolutely no way we're continuing and we should get the hell out of there right now. If we do call, it's probably based on some sort of refusal to do that hand reading that you just did there. And I'm not saying you are going to call. I have no idea what you're going to do. But if a student does call here, that's why. What does Jess do? Three, two, one. We do fold. 
excellent we are seeing more <laughs> of this folding going on this is a lovely fold it's a very important fold to make because it's a huge blunder to call here but here's why i bring it up it's a very common blunder you see students call there all the time because they're like the ace didn't really change his range it's like yes it did because he's not big betting again with sevens eights nines all these margins you were beating on the flop and you nailed that good job Okay, three bet pot, ace jack, go for a small C bet, pick up a call, diamond draw on the turn. I think you can definitely bet here. I think you can definitely check here. I think in practice, one is likely better than the other. And with that hint, I will let you go off and maybe do an exploitative thought process here. Is it better to bet? Is it better to check? And why? This is not an easy task. Don't stress if you don't get it right, but do your best. Let's go. I think it's better to bet here again, because we've picked up more equity from our flop. Okay. But if you had a hand like, what's a good example? Say you had a hand like, it doesn't really work here because there isn't like a second pair, but if that was a queen, for example, and you had like queen jack of spades, it wouldn't be good to bet, right? It would be a check because it'd be the middle of your range. So picking up equity doesn't always mean that you want to bet because usually picking up equity only turns your hand into a bet if it pushes you up into a value bet or pushes you from a hopeless bluff into a bluff with a bit of implied odds now, with a bit of improvability. If your hand is mediocre, you do not bet just because you picked up more equity. That'd be a really sloppy habit, right? We'd want to get out of that. I think here betting is the right answer, but that's because it's clearly a value bet. And I think it would be really useful going forward if you would try to be explicit with yourself and with me too, but mostly with yourself about I'm value betting the turn. Not I'm betting because I picked up equity, but the fact I picked up extra equity improves my hand to being a clear value bet, whereas it might not be normally. So right. it actually pushes it into that domain. All bets on the turn are either fundamentally value bets or fundamentally bluffs. And it's really cool to label them as one of those, you know, when you're going through a turn thought process or river right. for that matter. Sizing. What sizing is this hand allowed to value bet? Is there a sizing that would be too large? If so, what would that be? And what would the right sizing be? I think maybe anywhere from like half pot to three quarters pot. I feel like that's too big. I feel like when you start going three quarters pot here, what you're doing is ruining the value of your hand because you need to remain in good shape when called. What are the hands that we're getting called by here that we beat? That we get that we beat? Like well, we're value 10, betting. Flush mm -hmm. draws, mm -hmm. with the spade. And pocket pairs too, right? We could get called by jacks again or tens or queens or something if we bet small enough. So if we bet big here and you're saying the only hands you beat are spade draws and ace ten, you're probably gonna be a dog when called, actually, because villain still has sets two pair ace queen. So it's not clear to me that you can actually value bet for B seventy five if that were the case. The problem is here that you're putting two and two together and getting nine because you're saying I have a pair and I have a flush draw, therefore I can bet B75. But actually, I don't think your equity against your opponent's range justifies that sizing in this spot. I had third pot here, or I'd half pot max, because I think your equity is in the 70s, not in the 80s. And that's what matters about how big you bet. So remember, bluffing we talked about earlier, think about world favorability, how selective do I need to be, is it overfolded or underfolded? That's the sort of roadmap for bluffing. With would-be value bets like this one, we start with equity. Equity is the sort of be-all and end-all. If we have enough for a certain bet size, we can use that size theoretically. So big bets here, 75% would be around, you know, 75, 80% equity for a B75. I really don't think we have that much equity. We have a lot, but I don't think we have that much because we are losing here to quite a few combos too. Half Especially okay. when they call that big bet. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're, yeah, after the big oh bet, God. we will be in. Yes, this is good. The sizing is actually great. Like, I like the sizing a lot. This is perfect. I couldn't have picked a better sizing, actually. All right, I'm going to give you 10 seconds and I want you to tell me what you should do here. Go. I think uh, check. Keep all of their bluffs in. People love to call down on missed flush draw boards like this. Stop. Are you bluffing if you bet here? Oh. What is this no. closer to if you were to bluff? Would it be closer to a value bet or closer to a bluff? Closer to a value bet. Right. So in that case, why are we talking about whether they will call you down? You're making it sound like you're bluffing. You're making it sound like you have king high. Maybe I'm misunderstanding though, but that's how it sounds to me. When you say they love to call down here, you're assessing your fold equity in terms of whether you can get a bluff through. Yeah. So I'm yeah I'm seeing this as a bluff when I'm saying that. You're obsessed with bluffing, really just obsessed with yeah. it. Can't get enough of bluffing. So so <laughs> obsessed with bluffing that you want to take a hand with sixty two percent equity. Check it in the solver, guys. If you don't believe me, yeah, go off you go. Check it. Let, let me know in the comments. I bet you I'm right. Just kidding. I have no idea, but I think it's something like that. Turning a hand with 50-60% equity into a bluff is like absolutely insane and you haven't done that. I'm sure you won't do that in game, but the fact that you're wired that way just shows you how far we need to drag your subconscious thought process away from bluffing everything and into the realm of being objective. 
assessing your equity and being a true sort of theoretician, carrot poker school style student of the game where you say my equity is 50%, therefore it's bang in the middle. Therefore I check and you do check, which is great. And if you were to bet, you could bet two big blinds or three big blinds or 3.5 big blinds. You could make a very thin block, maybe, but I don't know about that. But certainly you can't bet big anymore. Villain checks back. Also, they don't have that many bluffs. You say keep their bluffs and they basically only have like threes or fours or something at this point. I don't think I would check call the river, so I don't love the thought process keep their bluffs in, because I think I would actually fold to a river bet here, and happily so, because of that. Because even the queen is, is binked the river, right? Even like king, queen, queen, jack of spades, queen, ten of spades, they've all binked, right? So there's really nothing we want to bluff catch against here, other than a few combos of like jack, ten of spades, and it's not enough of range. So if you bluff catch in this spot, you will lose. So I don't like the thought about, you know, how much fold equity you have in the river. I think that's backwards. And I also don't like the thought about bluff catching the river or leaving their bluffs in because I don't think you can call against the river bet. So I don't think either of those thoughts really hits the mark. I think the way to hit the mark here is to say medium equity hand, can't value bet, can't bluff, check, and you're done. That's all you really have to do. Right. And I think you have that. You just have all this extra paraphernalia that you don't need, but you do have that. So it's a case of stripping yeah. back the old horrible wallpaper from the 50s here you know when you sort of strip your wallpaper it's happening in my house right now and it's always like brown flowers because apparently at some time in the past it was good to put brown flowers all over your wall as if they're even a thing <laughs> get rid of that strip it all out nice coat of new carrot poker school theory oriented paint here as exploits to these spots too but not when you have the middle of your range there would never be an exploit here where you could bluff or value bet this hand big would you reckon should we do one more for the audience or should we just like take this video away from them right now and end it? You choose just one more. Imagine you said end the video. You'd be like the least popular contestant on this show ever. <laughs> Deuces. Open. Call. I actually love this C-bet because again, I think if you check, you'll face the turn aggression too often and then it'll suck because you'll be in this node where you have to fold like way too often. So this is, this is good. I like to bet this part of my range against this pool. I think you can bluff here if you want to. I don't think you have to by any means. I think it's quite close. And I think this river you do want to just overbet or something. I think this is a spot where you have tons of new value hands. And yeah, like this is probably going to be an overfolded spot. Because here's the catch. In GTO, villain is meant to slow play the hell out of this river. Because they expect you to bet quite often on this card. This card is good for your range. So in GTO, villain is going to check with a flush. They're going to check with a set. They're going to check with a straight. And they're going to check raise you. They're going to be a snake in the grass. Now, how do you expect this pool to behave with those hands? What, with all those made hands? All those I good, nutty hands, yeah. Yeah, I think they'll probably bet the river because we've checked the turn and they've yeah. missed a bit of value. Yeah, they're just getting antsy. They want their value. So they're going to play very much in that way. And therefore, we can sort of bluff with impunity on a run out like this that basically rejuvenates our fold equity. The king is rejuvenating the fold equity because it causes them to have to sort of reconsider all their 9 7, a 7. 10 6 suited, just random queen x. You overbet here, you b150. Let me teach you another trick. Imagine you b150 this spot, and you bet 3 into 2. Now you can do the very same thing as before. You can add your bet into the pot. Don't add his bet or her bet because this person isn't going to be calling. Hopefully, for bluffing, we're not getting called. So let's assume we're not getting called. We bet 3 into 2 here. We need to get back our 3 to break even. How much do we need out of the pot? So we bet three into two. Yep, so we, we bet three, pot becomes back. five. We need to get the yeah. three back. So we need three out of five back. You bet three, pot yeah. becomes five. You need to get your three back out of the five. So is this like 60%? Is it this is. about minimum defense frequency or something? It's not about minimum defense frequency. It's about how often your bluff needs to work, right? So your bluff here, if you be 150, needs to work 60% of the time to be as good as checking, assuming that checking has zero EV to it, which I think is fair. So yeah. you need 60% folds, so you get like 75 you be 150 here, you'll get like 75% fold equity against this pool in this spot. You need to overbet here. Yeah. Yeah. Don't like the check. What you're doing here is you're not fighting enough in an overfolded spot. We saw before that you weren't calling in an overbluffed spot, and now you need to fight harder in the overfolded spot. You're very good at bluffing when you feel like the stakes are high and that like you have to and you're backed into a corner. You're not good at fighting for the scraps of small pots, but these are ultimately what constitutes your red line being healthy, your graph going steadily upwards and it actually negates a lot of the variance in the game if you can find all of these spots. So my homework for you this week is fight, fight, fight for these little pots. If 
you have a bluff candidate and it's overfolded, don't start betting randomly with the middle of your range. And also look to pick your flop lines and turn lines a bit more carefully. If you think that people are stabbing a lot when you check to them, don't check air to them. See bet your air on good boards for your range and check stronger hands and go for check raises and stuff. Play a bit more, I guess, prophylactically in the sense that you want to set up your strategy in a way that it's already good against what your opponent's likely to do. You're kind of setting a trap, you're setting the snare, and you're hoping that the pool falls into it. That's what we want to do a little bit more. Yeah. That session today was very different to the previous sessions in format. So how has this left you feeling? Quite good, actually. I've had like a sneaking feeling that it's the little kind of regular spots where I'm falling over and it's just building into massive pots of money that I'm losing every day or month. And I, I think it's just 100% right. Like this is a $2 pot and I'll probably just be like, sigh, he's probably got something and he's not folding and check it back. Instead of actually concentrating on it, like you say, like if he does have a really good made hand here, he's definitely not checking the river because because they just don't. We don't even have to go that far. You don't have to use this binary language that people are or aren't doing things, that things are black and white. You can actually just say they're checking the river way less than they should with these hands, and therefore your fold equity is likely higher, all else being equal. Then when you, you know, pair that up with the fact that we're recommending overbet here, you can see why the fold equity is so huge. I think you can work on just the way you think about the game. There's just so much old wallpaper in your game. I'm just struggling to tear it all down. You know, I want to repaint yeah. these walls, but there's so many like little bad habits that you're doing. If I'd got my hands on you earlier, I could have maybe like intervened sooner and fixed some of this. And we can still fix it. It is a case of uninstalling a lot right now. And what I might need you to do in the next week or so is stop yourself a bit more. Deliberate maybe even during your streams. You could sort of work on, because you've got that accountability on stream. You could work on talking a bit to the audience and saying, I just almost said X, let me take that back and, you know, try and apply what I'm learning now from these sessions and from the Carrot Poker School. You are making your way through that 33 hour video course that's available at CarrotCorner.com. Completely subtle plug. What was the final thing I was going to say to you? Why don't you tell everyone a bit about your Twitch channel before we wrap up? What do you do on it? What's it called? And how can they follow you there? So Jessica underscore T on Twitch, Twitch streaming for the Flip community on GG, just cash games, mostly Russian cash this week, playing the International Women's Day event actually tomorrow, but in general, Russian cash. And yeah, just listening to kind of emo, pop punk and chilling and bouncing around when we get bluffs through. Love it. Yeah, we're trying to work on like dialing that part back a little bit. Do you ever play any Ukrainian cash or is it always Russian cash that you play? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> right, we'll leave it there. You were like, oh no, like war joke on, on, on stream. That's never good. No, I couldn't resist. Every time I hear Rush and Cash, I hear it as Russian Cash. Yes. Anyways, guys, this has been a really cool session. I'm really happy with the outcome of this session on a serious note. And I think if you can apply half of what we've talked about here, you're going to see that red line level off and you're going to see the graph win and we're going to get you mauling in absolutely no time. Just you can do this. I know you've got the capability. You've just got the wrong things installed, but we can do that. We can deal with that. Fingers crossed. All right, guys, if you like what we do here at Carrot Corner, don't forget to check out our paid content at carrotcorner.com. Cash Injection is our exploited, of course, where we learn how to devastate the pool across 10 keynotes. We also have the Carrot Poker School on there. And if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, what are you doing? Please help us grow. Help us continue to provide this free content to you. Do like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you back here for the next episode of From Stalling to Mauling.